everybody has an answer to the question, what matters most? And, and, um, and they say, man, when I was a kid, all I want to do is go outside and throw the ball against the wall. My kid doesn't want to do that. Well, you, you didn't have an iPhone, an iPad, an Xbox. And so, so that, that thing you were calling hard work was, was, you, was entertainment. So let's call it what it is. Um, and you'd be inside playing Xbox too if you had it when you were a kid. So we buy books and we read things out of a deficit. So everybody applauds a new beginning. Nobody cheers on a long follow through. It's not sexy to have to live by a standard. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, go to naturalstacks.com. Brian Muncy is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy's an innovator. All right, guys, welcome back to the OPP. We are joined by Mr. Paul Reddick on the show today. Paul, thanks for hanging out with us again, and welcome back. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So I, I say again, and, and welcome back. If you're a new listener to the show, Paul was on one of the very first episodes, somewhere in the teens, 16 to 19, somewhere in that range. And uh, it was a really, really amazing episode. I've actually had people write in and ask what happened to it, and, and just a, a little blurb on what happened there. Uh, Paul is is one of us. He he likes to uh, be colorful with language and and uh, <laughs> had some opportunities with with big businesses and, and big big uh, corporations that you know maybe didn't want to hear that. So uh, that's why that episode is no longer around. Um, but uh, we're going to bring you something even better today. Um, sticking with our Twitter bios, 140 characters or less. Let's do this. Paul is, uh, I said this on the previous show, uh, aside from my dad, Paul has had the biggest impact on me, uh, of any man in, in my life. So Paul, tremendous wow. gratitude for that. And yeah. your uh, Instagram profile says that you work with people who care on projects that matter. Yep. Anything you want to add to that before we go? Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, for me, it's, that's always the measurement, right? I have to know that there's going to be something deeper. Um, even if it's not something I tend to agree with, you, you know what I mean? Or not agree with, but it doesn't have to mean something to me. I know it has to mean something to the person that I'm working with. So for me, I always want to kind of get in things that have more than just a measurement of money. It's obviously it's an important thing when it comes to business and stuff like that, but, um, it's just got to mean something, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, you know, how long did it take you to define that core value? And what has that meant um, for, for you and the projects that, that you work with now compared to five years ago, 10 years ago? Um, I think I've always had it. So if I had to go back to, you know, the, the thing that made me a coach or that made me successful, I, I've had some unbelievable um, coaches and mentors in my life. If I really had to go back and to say where things had to, where things uh, for me formed um, the belief that things had to have real deep meaning, it was these three nuns that taught me in St. Michael's School in Union, New Jersey. It was Sister Ann Dominic, Sister Margaret William, and Sister Gilbert. And they instilled in me many other things. But the bigger thing they did is these three amazing women demonstrated to me with everything they did, every act they had, um, this life of service. And um, it, it's just a part of who I am and it, how they demonstrated that. I think that was the first time that um, I, I really was, I really thought of that, you know, in, in, that, in that way. Um, and when I look back, I said, that's when it started for me was that's like everything they did meant something. It was, there was a passion of faith behind it, a belief behind it and helping people and serving people. So that's probably, that's, those, that's as early as I can go to remember where that, where those were, where those beliefs were formed. Okay. So I think a lot of our listeners probably know <clears throat> what that is for them. They're, they're pretty in tune with the core values. What advice would you give people to stay, you know, send kind of another person that we have in common is, you know, uh, front front sight focused, um, you know, to, to quote Mark Levine, <clears throat> but, but to, to sort of have blinders on it and to, to learn how to say no to certain things or to stay on that path. 
So the first thing you have to do is you have to articulate what your values are, right? So a set of values is deciding one time how you're going to behave forever, right? Or, you know, obviously you can modify them, but, but for me, um, I have a set of values for my business, have a set of values for my family. Um, and that's, and, and all that starts with is what matters most. If I could ask, if I could ask someone one question in their life, um, one question about what, uh, uh, how to organize their life. Sometimes we get wrapped up in the moment is what matters most, you know, is, is making a business move in this way? Is that what matters most is making an impact here? Is that what matters most is having time with your kids? Is that what matters most improving your health? Is that what matters most? Everybody has an answer to the question, what matters most? And that's how you start to formulate your values, right? So what, you know, I can go through them if you want. Um, but, uh, you know, that's up, that's up to you, but, I would say that would be the start of everything is to start to surround yourself with that question. What, you know, what matters most to you as a business, family, leader, father, whatever, you know, whatever role you're in. Yeah. Let's go through them if you want. Yeah. So, so, so in our, in our house, um, our, our number one value is we honor God. So that means on Sunday mornings, we go to church, we live those values. Um, number two is we put our own mask on first. That means we take care of our health and our homework first. Right. So, um, and that's probably uh, agreed upon with everyone, um, uh, who listens to this, right? Is And so for me, um, I live that value and demonstrate that value, but I get up at 4.50 every morning um, and I have that two hour block before it gets too hairy here that I can work on me. I put my own mask on first. I do my busy work. I do my studying. I do my training in that time. Um, I, I do a lot of the health stuff that, you, you know, you've been so gracious to teach me. Um, and then, so af- after we, we put our own mask on first is um, we measure progress, not perfection. Right. We know that everything is not going to go the way that we want. Right. But we're measuring how good we were versus yesterday with not like against some arbitrary goal. Um, The third thing is that all touchdowns aren't logical. All the success that we have is not going to be a straight line to success. There's going to be different paths and different ways that we're going to go around that. Um, uh, The last one is all losses aren't fair. And sometimes you're going to do everything right and and you're still going to lose. Um, and so, uh, in, you know, here we say like, you know, don't get in the way. Sometimes a loss is a great teacher. You know, sometimes the best thing that you, that can happen to you is you get stung or you get bitten. So, um, in, in seminars, I have this big, like, uh, life-size snake. Like if you saw this thing, you, you, it's not real, but if you saw it, you wouldn't go, it's fake, right? It looked real. And I pulled it up and I make the point that sometimes the thing that bites you also contains the thing that will heal you. So snake um, what do they call it? like the, the, the An- vaccine anti-venom. snake bite anti venom. Yeah. yeah. It comes from the snake without the snake. So sometimes the thing that bites you can also um, heal you. And then our last uh, value is be the bumblebee. And so there's a long story uh, behind that. <clears throat> but what that is for me is that the bumblebee is the great pollinator of the world. It does a very simple job yet 70% of the oxygen we breathe is created from the pollinating work of the bumblebee. 70% of the food that we eat is created from the crops from that pollinating work. If the bumblebee goes away, we're in real trouble. And so the way I look at it is the bumblebee goes from flower to flower, from plant to plant, it pollinates. It never asks a single thing from the flower. The work that it does, it just moves on, does its job. It makes everything work. It makes everything look better. Right, it makes everything prettier, and what they take from that, they take back to their hive, and they make honey. Honey is the only food that doesn't go bad. So, what they create from that pollinating work, from those small little, small little deposits they make, create something that stays forever. So, um, one of the ways that I do that in my life is every morning when I'm sitting in the smallest room of my house <laughs> and I'm thinking, um, I will scroll, scroll through my contacts and whatever name jumps out at me. Um, or if I'm thinking about somebody, I will send them some kind of message, some kind of, Hey, checking in on you. Hey, love you, man. Or, Hey, no, you're going through a tough time. How can I help? I will, I will do one small thing. And I promise you, if you do that for 30 days, you'll be amazed at how it changes your life. Um, so that's the last one is, is be the bumblebee. <laughs> that uh, messaging people in the morning is one that I've shared uh, on the show before. And that if yeah. you guys heard it, Paul's the one that told me to do that. There was a time in my life where I was kind of wallowing in, in self-pity and feeling bad for myself. And no. that's, that's how I phrase it. But oh, no, I, I mean, look, look, we all, we all go through sort of down times, <laughs> right? And, and it was a, a period of 
I, I don't want to say about <laughs> with depression, but you know, along those lines, right? And yeah, well, you know, we'll and, calling it what it is. We all go through. I go through depression just as much as anybody else. You know, right? And, and that was Paul's suggestion was you know to stop thinking about myself first thing and uh, to to text five people every single day for thirty days, and it made a huge difference um, in in yeah. my life and in everyone else's life that it touched. So you know, that, that's great advice and, and something I still do to this day. Obviously, you do too. So, yep. Um, yep. Let's talk about something you were you were recently on uh, the Joe DeFranco show, and that was a great yep. podcast. We'll put a link to that in the show notes if people want to follow up and, and listen to that one. Um, but you mentioned something on there, and this is something that uh, actually I still have the original notebook from when I came to the GFGI seminar in 2012. It's right behind yep. my computer. I'm, I can see it right now. Um, <laughs> I, pull, I pulled it. I pulled it out just to look through some stuff uh, recently, but you said something on that show that is actually in that notebook and and is stuck with me from the very beginning on the show. You said, you know, what you do in business, in your personal life, whatever is limited by your own growth and development. Um, and and it's actually the second page of slides from the, from the notebook back in 2012. You can't just dump a bunch of money on you or the problem. Uh, you have to remove it. Yep. It's still going (laughs) to be you. Exactly. So talk a little bit about that. So, so we get guys, um, we, we get two types of people that come into our seminar. We get people that come in with a wall around them and they have built themselves a prison that, um, that no one can get into and they can't get out of and they can't figure out what's going on. We get people that are stuck. Um, we get people that stumble into our seminar and don't know where to go. Um, and so <clears throat> the way I look at it is this. Um, so I, the leaning tower of Pisa, I like to use this as an example, right? So if you were going to measure these floors, right, this top floor is, is the most screwed up. It's 5.5 degrees off, right? So the, so the top floor is the expression of dysfunction. So why a lot of people get stuck is they built as far or as high as they can hold. So I'll ask people, would you ever build floors on top of this? No. No, it'll break right? It'll topple over it. And the faster you build the floors, the faster it will topple over. So when people come in and they're stuck or they're struggling, or they're just, they built a wall around themselves, they built as high as they can go. And what they perceive in their mind is intuitively, they know if I continue to build floors on this thing, this whole thing is going to crumble because right now I am barely holding this thing together right now. This thing is designed to stay up just like it is. If you add four, and then they've reinforced it too in the last um, I don't know what it was recently. Um, so it's designed to stay up. So if, if I want, if, if this was going to topple over though, right. Um, where would, where would you say it would break Muncie? <clears throat> well, do people call you Ryan on this show? Cause I know like, are you wrong? You can call me whatever you want. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say somewhere like right in the, yeah, in the middle Okay. That's where everybody says, that's where I believe that I thought it would break for a long time. It doesn't break there. Um, that's where the most pressure is, right? So the pressure is here. These bricks are being bound together. The pressure is hard right here. It's going to tear here. It's you. So this is the thing that's messed up, right? This is where the problem, this is where the problem manifests in life, right? This is the argument we have. This is the business that can't get out of the, the garage. This is all these things right here. This is where the pressure is, but it tears on the opposite side of the pressure. So usually it tears in your marriage or it tears in your personal relationship or it tears in your health or it tears in your time, right? So this is what's messed up. This is where the pressure is. This is where it tears. Where's the problem? You. It's, it's, the, the, problem? Very, it's the very bottom layer. The very Foundation, first floor. Right? Yeah. Everything, every floor of this building is what we call a consequential floor. It's dependent on the floor before it. So if the foundation's messed up, the first floor is going to be messed up. Odds are the second floor is going to be messed up, third floor. And all of a sudden, the top floor is going, hey, what do you want from me? You know, look down. Look, these guys are screwed up. And so what, we, what oftentimes people have to do, and I don't even remember the question, but we're going to finish this. So if, 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 we, if we go here, is that most of the times when, when people come in and they're in a cage that they built and they can't get out of, they're struggling or, they, or they're stuck. Here's why is that there's usually a foundational problem and they're trying to fix what's screwed up, where the pressure is or where it's tearing and they're not fixing the issue. So the issue, like you've helped me in many, many ways, the issue sometimes is uh, your nutrition, right? Your intake, your supplements, knowing what is good for you and not good for you. Sometimes that issue is um, you've, you had bad advice when you were a kid. You had an uncle who told you you couldn't do it. I had a sophomore guidance counselor who told me I was stupid and I could forget about baseball. That shifted my foundation for a long time. 
Maybe it's that you've had something really hard happen to you. Maybe you had something, uh, somebody violated you or somebody uh, did something horrible to you, or maybe you were, you were a part of a, a home that wasn't um, uh, solid or, or, or there was dysfunction in your home. And I can talk about that. I'll, I'll open up all my wounds. Um, and so what happens is, is that if we don't fix that foundation, we're just stuck. We're just stuck. So we can't build. We want to build. Mm-hmm. But we can't build because this structure right now can't hold anymore. So here's what we do, though. We go to seminars, we go to things, and we go to things that make us feel good but don't make us good. So what we do is we take this building and we push it straight, and we spend maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks holding it, and they're like, it looks good, right? It looks good. It looks good. I'm exerting effort. I'm exerting force on this. It looks good, right? Okay, great. And then you walk away, and the building falls right back. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Um, <clears throat> I don't remember what the question was. You answered the question beautifully. Okay. So, Good. so the, the follow up to that then would be uh, probably the, the three numbers that are behind you. How do you help the people who come in uh, identify that foundation so that they're no longer looking at that stress point or or the you know the the expression of the problem? So I got to find out what matters most. Right. If we think of if what we think about comes about, it seems real easy to change what we think about. Right. Hey, you just scroll through Instagram. Stop negative thoughts. Let go of the past. Think positive. Right. Just, that all works. Right. Doesn't it? Um, so the way to do it is I, I have to get into your heart. And if I can get into your heart and I can rearrange some things, that blood will, that blood will flow from your heart and into your brain. So I got to rearrange some things in your heart. I knew that was going to happen. Um, so uh, as we're talking about it, <laughs> as we're talking about it, thank you, Jesus. Okay. So, um, if, as, as if we're, if, if we're talking about this, I got to get inside your heart and I can't get inside your heart where we'll still, where, where, when we're still talking about the visible structure of your building, I can't get into your heart. If you're still talking about your business, I can't get into your heart. If you're still talking about the problems that are the manifestation of a bad foundation, I got to get into your foundation. I got to move things around. Now, the way on a building like the leaning tower of Pisa, there's two ways to make it straight. I get a bulldozer, which is probably the fastest and the cheapest way. I love this metaphor because if I get a bulldozer and I bulldoze it, that town falls off a cliff. Financially, tourism, the culture, the history, it becomes insignificant if I tear down the thing that made you important. And most people in life are trying to run away from the only thing that made them significant. Because maybe they're a little tired. We can talk about that later. So the only, now think about the construction project it would be. The second way I could do it is if I could push that building and I could get, I could fix the foundation, right? I got to imagine that that would be a multi-million dollar, I don't even, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? You would probably bring in the the um, archaeological historians, restoration experts. There would probably be people lined up to do it for free, you know, because they wanted to work on it. You would have the best of the best to fix this historical building. And the only reason you would go to all that trouble to do all that work to reconstruct that may take years, that may take highly skilled labors, that may take a lot of time, that may take hundreds of million dollars because it means something. If there's one message I could get to the people who are listening to this, um, I don't want to be a cliche and say you matter. What I will say is what you have is a gift. What you have is a talent. What you have is the skill is probably more of a weapon than you think it is. It's probably more value than you think it is. You're probably doing better than you think, and you're probably on the right path. It's just sometimes sometimes things get muddled where too many people can look at you and say, look at your building. It's crooked. Pressure there. That thing's off. It's tearing over there. So I got to get into your heart. So let's get into your heart, Muncie. How about that? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Give me a hard goal. I'm going to crack you open. Let's break some eggs. All right. Um, <laughs> Give me a hard goal. Not like be happy, not make an impact. I mean, right. You need a hard goal like right. number of listeners on this podcast or something like that. All right. Um, so you and I haven't had this conversation yet, um, but to, to fill you in, um, I'm working on writing a book and it's going to launch in the awesome. next few months. And the goal is to make it a bestseller. And in okay. 2018, I want to move uh, 100,000 copies Okay. or reach 100, reach 100,000 people with the book. Awesome. Okay. So what I have here is a list one through seven on this list. Right. So we're going to play a game. Are you the type of person that likes to play a game or win games? Uh, 
I heard Joe DeFranco's answer. <laughs> I like to win games. Okay. So the way you win this game is through speed. How do you win the game? Speed. Okay. So I'm going to ask you the same question six times in a row. You give me the first word or two that pops into your mind as fast as you can. Take your hand over your mouth. There's no reason to protect yourself. You're talking, we're just me and you talking, Muncie. We're good buddies. Okay. So, so uh, when, when you think of a bestseller and that, and, that, and that forms in your head, what's important to you about having a bestseller that sells 100,000 copies to you? In a word it, or two. It, it's the reach. Yeah. It's reach. Impact? Yeah. Okay. So it's impact. What's important to you about being an author who has impact? Uh, being able to help people. Yeah. What's important to you about being a man that helps people? Uh, I, I think that's my mission. I think that's why I'm here. Yeah. What's important to you be, to be, uh, what's important to you about being a man who accomplishes his mission? Um, uh, satisfying your soul. I, I mean, I think that's, yeah. yeah. What's important to you? Uh, what's important to you about being a man whose soul is satisfied? Uh, at, at the end of my life, I can look back and say, you know, I, I accomplished what I was here to do and, and I made an impact. I made the world a better place for having been here. Yep. What's important to you about being a man who leaves the world a better place than you found it to you? I, I just think that's why we're here. I, I think that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Give me a better word. That's weak. Give me a better word. Give me a word that's, give me a Ryan Muncy word that's, that's worthy and, 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 and purpose. purpose. That's much better. So here's the thing now is that your five, six, seven is, is, is to fill your soul, to leave the world a better place so that you fulfill your purpose, right? You were put here for a reason, whatever we believe spiritually about different things. Everybody's got their beliefs. It doesn't matter. We all believe there's something, even if it's just the universe, right? And so, if I have your five, six, seven, um, and let's say I'm coaching you and you're struggling in any way, shape or form, I've got the keys to the lock for you and I'm not manipulating you. I'm not, um, I'm not doing this in a way that's trying to get you like, don't you want to be a bestseller? Cause look, uh, this guy was a bestseller and you could be like this guy and he's, he's famous and people love him. No, I could say, Ryan, you're, you're struggling writing this book right now. Uh, let's make sure, remember why we're doing this. We're doing this so, so you fill your soul. So you leave the world a better place. Cause this is your purpose. So let's write today. Let's get right. What's, what's and now all I'm doing is I'm giving back to you what you handed to me. I'm not manipulating you. I'm not, uh, we make three motivational mistakes. Here they are. Number one is that we think what motivates us will motivate others. What motivates me does not motivate you, mm -hmm. right? We've had this conversation. Um, I, I find that a lot of times with, with parents, you know, I deal, do a lot of work with dads and, um, and they say, man, when I was a kid, all I want to do is go outside and throw the ball against the wall. My kid doesn't want to do that. Well, you, you didn't have an iPhone and iPad and Xbox. And so, so that, that thing you were calling hard work was, was you was entertainment. So let's call it what it is. Um, and you'd be inside playing Xbox too, if you had it when you were a kid. So number two is that we think what motivates others will motivate us. Right. That we, that it, so every person has like this robo person in their life. Right. We hate them. Right. We just hate them. Um, they get up at four in the morning. They, they, they listen to binaural beats for an hour and then they, they, do, they do Taekwondo and they do Filipino stick fighting. And then they sit in a sauna for 30 minutes and then they, then they go to cryotherapy and then they do their, their dry needling and then they go to work and they, they work 12 hours and then they go to the gym because they're working out with you. Know, they're doing a meditation with a Buddhist monk that's living with them coming from to bed and then they sleep in a chamber with a tempur bed that hugs them and they have a person that whispers you're awesome you're awesome in their ear as they sleep right we all have that person in their in our life that we we're hating and and here's the thing don't ever think that what they have is better than what you have because i'm going to tell you that lifestyle hits a wall um usually what's fueling that is pretty unhealthy um and when it hits a wall i've been there when it hits a wall it's usually pretty ugly so don't think what motivates others should motivate you. And then we think what should motivate us motivates us. So some people use death as a motivator. Death is a horrible motivator. Here's the thing, because death, we, normally, we usually don't die. You know, like live today like you're going to die tomorrow. And then you wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm still here. You know, most people live a full life, right? So knock on wood, knock on everything. God bless us all. Let's hope we live as long as we can. But some people use death as a motivator. Some people use business success as a motivator, an amount of money, a car, a house as a motivator. What should motivate you um, is not what's going to motivate you. So like I said, if I can, do, if I can get you, if I can, if I can get you for five or ten minutes 
and I can get inside your heart. I can rearrange those things. I can let that blood, blood flow up to your brain, and then I can change you. I've been really humbled. A lot of people, you know, like your words have said, man, you, you, you changed my life. I didn't do anything. I didn't change your life. I changed your mind. And then you, you made some different decisions for there. I changed your mind about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And um, so the heart of the five, six, seven for me is, um, especially as leaders, which I think probably a lot of people listening, right, or to your podcast are leaders in their field or, or at least seeking excellence. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you should do is do it on yourself. Um, you should share your five, six, seven with your team, your family, your children, because a, a five, six, seven sets the beat. And then you're, everyone around catches the rhythm. But a lot of times, especially men, men don't, don't communicate. They don't, they don't lead when they, when something goes wrong, they go silent. So if there's no beat, nobody can catch a rhythm. If the beat is so soft that people are, can't hear you, can't hit through. If the beat is, then, then right. If people can't handle it. Right. Or if it's, and then it stops for a month and then, Right ask Andres and all those guys about our team meetings. Right. Don't have them on. Or, or is there a steady beat? Is there a steady beat that now I can catch the rhythm and a drummer that changes the beat, the whole band looks to them to get back on rhythm. A drummer that can't hold the beat gets fired by his band. Mm -hmm. So that's the job of us as leaders is to set the beat, set the beat from our heart so that they can catch the rhythm. And, um, I do this a lot with teams, you know, teams that are sports teams and teams that are business teams. And um, so I'll have like a coach say, yeah, my team's not together, scattered all over the place. Can't get them to work together. <clears throat> and I'll say, um, I'll do a five, six, seven with them. And I'll say, if I were to walk into your team right now and write this five, six, seven on the board, would they, would they recognize that as the goals that your company or your sports team have? Or do they think their job is to win this Friday or to get the project done or to make this many sales? Do they think, and every time I've done that, they always say, yeah, they think their goal is to do this because that's the only thing we're measuring. Mm -hmm. So what we measure, we make important. And what visibly frustrates us, people will try and fix so when you have a five, six, seven, and, and the reason why your team is scattered and not together, or maybe your family is not together or your, your, whatever you are is not together is again, you have not articulated the beat. There's a silent beat and they don't know. They don't know. They don't have a drummer who's studying beat. So they can't catch a rhythm that is non-existent. Yeah. You know, I've, I've never heard you use the beat analogy before. And, and as you, That's new. as you first said it, um, that, that well, I actually wrote that down as a question to ask you. I mean, is the beat culture? Like when you talk about sports, yeah. te sports teams want to create culture or organizations want to create culture. I mean, that's what you're building it around are, are those values that beat. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, everybody has. So when I, when I coach guys on this or business on that is that there's the articulation and then the demonstration. Right. So articulating is the easy part. Right. Here's what it is. So that that's a big step where where it didn't exist before. And now it exists. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, the demonstration is the key, because what people will see over time is that they will get on beat and they will write their own songs. But people need to understand that the songs are coming from you and they'll know that through your unique sound. So these words, if I had, if, you know, if I brought your wife in and I told her these words, they would not be foreign to her. She would, she would recognize these as your words. I did a five, six, seven with a guy one time who said, I feel like you gave me the words to a song that has been playing in my head my whole life. And that's the key. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Pearl Jam, the Who, they all played the same instruments, but they created different sounds. So your sounds are going to be unique to you and um, the people around you will recognize them as the sounds that are familiar to them. I like that. And, and that's, you made a post recently on Facebook where, you know, you were talking to <laughs> business owners, entrepreneurs, you know, just because somebody else does something doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And, and you use that, you know, if, if you two had not formed a band because Led Zeppelin had already done music, we wouldn't have yep. you two or, you know, so. Right. I love that. You mentioned uh, the drummer is the guy who keeps the beat in the band. So he's the one that's sort of like setting the pace and everybody looks to him and, and goes off of him. And that, you know, as leaders, that's, that's the role of a leader. Yep. I think I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, but I think a lot of people who see themselves as leaders are trying to be the front man, the lead guitarist. What are your thoughts on that? 
Um, you, you know, it, it doesn't flow perfectly with the metaphor, so I don't like the question. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, it, here's the thing is that <clears throat> I think in, in all marketing and all business, your customer should be the star, right? It's kind of cliche. It's been beaten to death. Um, but remember that um, uh, if you're going to put a band together, um, you, we always see that bands in fighting kills a band, right? Who mm-hmm. gets to be the man? Right. Right. So I often point to Richie Sambora. So Richie Sambora was the guitarist for Bon Jovi. And, you know, he was writing some of the songs and I don't know the whole thing, but he thought, hey, I'm, I'm as good as Bon Jovi. Right. And he tried to do it on his own and couldn't. Right. Uh, we, we always make the joke, right. The East Street Band. Yeah. Right. That, that it, it's pretty cool to be an East Street Band. You know, like you don't have to be Bruce. You know, so um, sometimes, and, and what you'll find too is a lot of times in bands that the lead singer is not really the glue or the, you know, the star, straw that serves the drink. I know in U2, um, it's the guitarist, the edge is really the guy that kind of drives really the, the music. And I, I don't know what it is in, in other groups, but I'd imagine that. And what you find is that sometimes the guy up front is maybe he looks like the brains of it, um, but you know, there's usually a guy that is. Um, you know, that, that is more of the, the engine, you know? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't make that statement or pose that question to, to poke a hole in your analogy, but in more of a, <laughs> Thanks, Monty. More, more, it was going so good. No, more, more <laughs> in a sense of like seeing, seeing where a lot of people who are trying to be leaders are maybe taking a misstep and, and instead of being yeah. the drummer and saying, Hey, tribe, this is our beat. This is, these are our values, you know, and instead of sort of empowering the others and letting others take the, the forefront, you know, they're the ones trying to get out front and be the rah, rah, kind of like everybody look at me, make me famous, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it, it's a, it's, it's it very, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly in our businesses, um, I, I encourage people to step out and step in front. It's, it's not always the easiest thing. And to be perfectly honest, it's not always the easiest thing to tame your ego. It's not always the easiest thing to maybe watch work that maybe you could have done at a hundred percent being done at 98%. Um, but you know, that's the only way you grow. So it's something I struggle with too. Just, you know, we, the only reason I know this um, is because I had to learn it. Right. So I've never bought a book with the title, how to be a five ten Irish white guy that can't jump and can't dance. I've got that down. I got it. I don't need a book on it. I'm demonstrating it. I'm demonstrating that book. So we buy books and we read things out of a deficit and all things are born in that deficit. So anything that I know about this came to me because of the two most significant moments, events in my life. When I, on June 30th, 2000, I lost my dad. Um, it's something I probably will never get over. It was like a, um, a cell phone call that dropped um, that I can't get back. Um, and, and, I, and I had sexual abuse um, by, by uh, an outside person uh, when, I was, when I was younger. And those two events have, have shaped my life. So a lot of the things that I had to learn was my own self-discovery of trying to get in and heal some of these things. And so, um, you know, just, just think as people uh, teach these things and you know, they present these things, I, I, I really... I, I hate the guru uh, or the person that teaches that kind of gives off the idea that they've got it all together because I'm going to tell you, as you well know, man, I can be a, I, I, I'm two seconds away from being a hot mess. You know, if I don't, if I don't keep this thing on the tracks. You mentioned before um, it's easier to articulate than to demonstrate. And in the very opening of this show, you mentioned, you know, that the people who had a big influence on you were the nuns who demonstrated in, in all of their daily actions. Talk, talk a little bit about, you know, how people listening can go from, okay, we've articulated what these values are. Now, how do we demonstrate them uh, in our daily actions? So th- that's where it gets boring. So everybody applauds a new beginning. Nobody cheers on a long follow through. So you want to get a hundred likes on your Facebook poster or your Facebook post, tell them that you started a new diet or you've got your starting a new venture venture. I had, um, I posted, we wrote, I just wrote a book for my baseball people, um, and, and got a lot of feedback on that. Right. Cause, but, but, but the long follow through, nobody cheers. So if there is one, there's one thing that I could, uh, hopefully give as a gift to your listeners is that, um, if you can handle the repetition, um, you'll be a success. It's the rep. It's the, it's the daily grind and the repetition that, that cuts people out. Every athlete, we know there's been so much documented research on this, that every athlete that succeeded at a very high level, there was independent work 
that they did. So they were in their garage uh, working out. They were hitting balls in, you know, you know, uh, after practice. They were taking 500 free throws at five o'clock in the morning. There was independent work that was away from a team. Every great athlete has had that. And the word that I wish everyone would understand, I try and get this to my baseball players, uh, my baseball parents, is the word again. The whole game is again. We want new and not again. Mm-hmm right? We'll even take a knockoff of something that is again, and they can polish off as something new and we'll buy it again. If you've been to a Batman movie in the last 20 years, you bought a knockoff. It looks new. It looks new, right? It's not new. It's again. So the whole, the, the thing that you is the repetition base is again, 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 again. It's where it gets boring. It's not sexy. It's not sexy to have to live by a standard. Right. It's like takes all the fun out of things. But what I would say is that I I think there's people that live. I think there's people that live life in a way that they would they would swear is very practical. But in many ways, it's probably the most impractical way to live. And when you start on something that uh, does not have a lot of mass appeal to it, a crowd does not form around you to applaud your decision. Most of the times that is done in private. And um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to articulate it, but I think a lot of times we think about that, that kind of long-term repetition as impractical, right? And boring, mm-hmm. uh, but probably the most practical way to live mm-hmm. in my sense. You know, I don't know if I made sense with that. No, it, it makes perfect sense. Um, we, we've had similar lines of discussion on the show before. If you guys are listening, definitely go back and check out the episode with Logan Gelbrick. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes. I forget what number it is. Uh, Logan is another writer who's, he's actually a baseball player as well. So you guys have some comment. I guess baseball players must, or at least the two of you think very similar, Uh, but he's got it coming up. Uh, It's called Go Right. And he touches on a lot of those things. Um, You know, making the hard choice or the right choice going right as opposed to going yeah, left and sort awesome. of settling, settling for the safe thing. Um, yeah, I love and, that, yeah. And, and for you guys listening, we've recorded a show and we're going to launch it when he launches the book. So stay tuned for that. Um, Paul, earlier you mentioned, you know, maybe people are tired and you said we could come back to that. Does repetition and again have anything to do with the point at which people kind of get tired and fall off? Yep. So it's endurance. So one of my favorite quotes is if you're tired with the footman, how will you run with the horses? You know, and I think it's the test, you know, it's, 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 can you, and I love the thing run with the horses because it implies that the horses run like that all the time. It's not like, can you run like a horse? You know, it's run with the, the horses go like this. Right. So, um, I, I find myself, so I, I'm going to tell you today, I'm tired. I'm, t- I'm tired today. This is the second podcast I did. We did a book launch yesterday. We're, I'm, I'm tired. But I know what I know is that this is a test. That to me, it's now, can, do I want to run with the horses? Um, I could have done a number of different things. I could have rearranged this. But I, I always got to say, if, if I say I want it, can I run with the horses? If I'm tired um, for a few things, how am I ever going to deal with the endurance it takes to really run the race? And I don't know who said it, but you know, like sometimes people quit five minutes before the miracle. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a philosophy in, in life that I got away from for a little while because I bought into the notion that um, you should protect your time and you should say no to things. So um, I started giving out my cell phone number everywhere so people can call me if they want 201-322-0840. And you know that's my real uh, number because you've had it for years. And, and here's the thing is that I think we should start saying yes to things. And so if I can say yes, I start to say yes. And I, I got away from that for a couple of years because I bought into some advice that really didn't serve me very well. Um, everything that ever came great to my life came from me saying yes. And people ask all the time, well, do you create parameters around that? Of course I do, you know, and we could talk about those, but, um, uh, if I can take somebody's call, I do. Um, and if I can't, I can't, right. I can't now, right. If somebody calls, but I get like 50 phone calls a day and I talk, I don't know, 15 or 20 people and everyone's very courteous in my time. And, um, and I made some unbelievable connections because of it, but I never want to get so far away is that when I started this business, I was living in my grandmother's attic. I had $14 to my name and I would have begged for the phone to ring. 
I would have begged for someone to pay attention to what I'm doing. So our baseball list goes out to like 480,000 people every day. Um, we do this mastermind five, six, seven Academy, which you're part of. <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of people, but I don't ever want to get away from that time that, <clears throat> um, where I would have begged for the phone to ring. And, um, so for me, I try to make myself available. And if I can say yes, I say yes. This, this week, I said yes to a baseball event with 1,200 coaches. And I said yes to one with 50 coaches. And it's because I could say yes. And I have some faith beliefs centered around that. And I believe that, the, that those, those things are put there um, as a way. Can you run with the horses? Can you bring the same excitement to 50 people that you do for 1,200 people? Because what I often find is that usually the 1,200 thing is real sexy. It's a little glamorous. It makes for a good Facebook post or maybe a selfie from the stage. But, uh, but in, throughout my life and the times that I've said yes, it's the one that there's 50 people at that there was somebody there that I was supposed to talk to. And because I was obedient to the, the thought of saying yes, and I said yes to the 50 and didn't shun it because somehow I'm above that, I don't know where we got that. Or somehow now all of a sudden my time has to be protected um, or my time is only worth X, right? I've never had anyone give me a definition, a, 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 a defendable statement that I didn't laugh at um, when they said this isn't worth my time. Um, so, I, you know, for me, <clears throat> I think it's, it's just like, are, are we available? Um, when did we start becoming unavailable? And can we say yes to things? And like I said, I have some beliefs around why that happens um, and why those opportunities come up. And I trust in those. There's a lot to unpack in that answer. And, you know, you mentioned saying yes and, and knowing when to say no. And I think the, the short answer is if, if you've clearly identified your values up front, you have clarity and it's very easy to say this is or this is not in line with my values. But then as you talk about, you know, showing up and, and delivering for a crowd of 50, the same way you would for a crowd of 1200 or 12,000, you know, that's the, the demonstration uh, of the things that you've previously articulated. And, and, and I, you know, when, when I previously asked, you know, how do you, how do you demonstrate it? I mean, you just did um, yeah. tell the story about um, Yogi Berra, because that, that is a prime example of going to a room where right. Yeah, if you guys are watching on video, there's a number eight in the Yankee pinstripes right behind Paul. Um, but that's an example of a story where you showed up for a small crowd, no expectations, only appreciation, and you delivered huge and it led to what? So, so in, in my heart, I was born a coach. <clears throat> um, if you're in front of me, I'm going to serve you, whether you can afford it or you, or you can't. That's just who I am. I can't stop it. So um, I accepted that and, and relished that role for a while. And so I said yes to a lot of opportunities that a lot of people would have said no to. So I said, um, well, first of all, if you don't know who Yogi Berra is, if you, if you said it's not over till it's over, come to a fork in a road, take it. Um, it gets late early. Those are all, he's the most quoted human being in history. Uh, he won 10 World Series and three MVPs with the Yankees. And those aren't even the best things about him. Um, so, um, so working for him, I mean, presidents, you know, met with Yogi Berra, um, celebrities, famous people. They, they, I mean, just, it's, it was incredible, incredible opportunities. And biggest thing was to be around him, to be around the genuine article of who he was as a man. If you want to talk about that, we can. But, um, so I was giving a T-ball clinic in the cafeteria, the Scotch Plains high school gym for about 17 people. Um, and T-ball clinic is like alligators to field, butterflies to catch, pull the bow, shoot the arrow to throw. It's boring, right? It's not sexy. Um, but at the time, the Yankees had a player named Chuck Knobloch who had the yips. So you should probably, I have a great yips guy for you to interview, uh, Dr. Tom Hansen. So the yips is like when an athlete um, loses like a basic function. So like they're throwing a ball. And so Chuck Knobloch had the yips where he would field the ball at second base, which was anywhere from, you know, he might be, 20 to 90 feet away from first baseman and he'd miss him by 40 feet or like a golfer, like cannot hit a ball. That's like, they've lost or something. <clears throat> uh, remind me, I'll hook you up with, with Dr. Okay. Tom Hansen. Okay. Um, and so Chuck Knobloch had the yips and it was a hot conversation because they were one of the great players in the Yankees. They were probably going to have to sit them. And so I didn't think it was mental. I thought it was physical and then manifested as mental. So I held up some video, uh, some pictures of him before and after. Um, guy comes up to me after and says, I'm the sports editor of the Star Ledger. Um, how'd you like to do a story on that Chuck Knobloch thing? Now, this was 1999, 2000, when 10 million people were still reading the Star Ledger. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. And um, uh, so that was Tuesday night. Thursday, I was in his office. 
And they were like drawing all these pictures. I'm like, what are they doing? Right. They're asking me to show like the different things. I thought it was gonna be a little, you know, blurb or something. And it was a full page article in the Star Ledger, right? So 10 million people or whatever it was got this. That Monday, I got a call from the Liberty Science Center, which is over across from the Statue of Liberty. They say, we're having a science and baseball symposium next week. Would you like to come speak at it? And we'll give you a table to promote your programs after you speak. And I was like, yeah, awesome. You know, this is how it happens, right? So I give my speech and I go back to my table and my table is next to the Yogi Berra Museum. And a woman named Lily was there, saw me speak and said, you need to come in and we need to work together and we need to be part of what you're doing. And uh, so that was Saturday. Tuesday, I'm sitting in the office of a guy that became one of my best friends, was in my wedding, Dave Kaplan. Um, And in walks Yogi Berra. He sits down next to me and says, introduce you. He goes, how you doing, kid? And that was it. Two weeks. So I got some faith beliefs on why that happens. Um, <clears throat> so two weeks, I went from doing a T-ball clinic to, um, to sitting with him. And there was no job there. Um, there was no position. We created the baseball camp there. I, I was a resident speaker there for the last 15 years of his life. I'm still involved there, still help out. Um, probably the greatest honor of my life. So when people ask me that, everybody hates the answer because they want me to tell them like a strategy I use. And my strategy is start saying yes to things. And just be and now. Now, <laughs> the trick is, if you go do a t-ball clinic next week, I don't know that you're going to be working for Derek Jeter in two weeks. Right. But nothing good will happen if you say no. Nothing ever good happens when you say no. Yeah, I mean, if if you really want to get overly cliche, it's the the Wayne Gretzky quote: "Like you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take." Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I'm always like, I was very, I remember like doing these speaking things and my contemporaries, my competitors would charge coaches to do this kind of stuff. They wouldn't even go near this stuff. So not only was I doing something that wasn't sexy, like nobody was lined up in front of me to do it. You know, it wasn't like a great opportunity, you know, to do it. Um, so, yeah. All right. Uh, let's give you a chance to talk about the five, six, seven Academy, the book. If our listeners want to get more of you uh, work with you, get coaching, read more of your work, where can they go? So I give out my number to call me up 201-323-0840. Um, your best chance is nine to five Monday through Friday. Um, then go to five, six, seven academy.com. Our November event is, uh, is sold out, but we do have an event coming up in January with Mark Fisher of Mark Fisher Fitness, who probably your guys would love. He's way, way out there. Awesome, awesome guy. I'm psyched about that. Um, or they can email me, Paul Reddick at Gmail. And that goes to my direct email. Two okay. D's, R-E-D-D-I-C-K. Okay. We'll put all those links in the show notes for you guys uh, on the blog post. That'll be naturalstacks.com slash Paul Reddick, R-E-D-D-I-C-K. Um, anything else on the book? Or is that just for baseball dads? Um, so it is just for baseball dads, but I mean, really any dad can use it. Um, it's five, six, seven dad. And you can go to five, six, seven dad.com. We actually give them away. All you gotta do is pay shipping and there's no like trials or membership. It's not one of those things. There's no upsells. It's actually just pay for the shipping, which is I think five, five bucks or something like that. Gotcha. Um, so one question that, that I forgot to ask you a little bit earlier, I want to make sure we get this in. Um, you, you've talked before about why people shouldn't copy what other people have done. Yeah. What's, what's the, the reasoning behind that? So, uh, you know, so here's the real answer. And, and, and uh, like, I think you, you know what my faith beliefs are. I've said it a couple of times. So, so here's where it goes back to, to me. And it's always not popular to talk about these things and shows like that, but I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of it. So I always believe God stamped you an original um, uh, there's not a, there's not a character that was duplicated in the Bible. There's no similar things. So my faith beliefs are if you were stamped an original and all those little swimmers, all those little swimmers were going around and there, and that one, I want that one. Right. And, and pulled you out. And, um, I, I believe with my heart of hearts that everybody's here. It's almost like you are a song. I forget the quote. Hold on. You want the quote? Yeah. Hold on. A sick, sick quote, sick quote. Hold on. Right. Hold on. Well, while, while you pull that up, I, 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 the, reason oh, I, the reason I wanted to get you to talk about this on the show was because I think a lot of our listeners uh, and a lot of the public is guilty of, you know, we, we want to know other people's morning routines or other people's biohacks or what, what, you know, if I only do exactly what, you know, Dave Asprey or Tim Ferriss or Tony Robbins does, then I'll be yeah. them. 
Okay, so so um, so uh, I should put on uh, Derek Jeter's uniform, put on his cleats, do his workout program. And here's the thing: is you can do all those things. You can copy everything up until the moment the game starts. And then what we say in the mastermind, then it's time to play football. And when that football and that ball gets snapped, we're going to know real quick. Here's a great analogy. I, I did a podcast on our show about it. So Bradley Cooper was unbelievable in, um, what was it? American Sniper. Yeah. Right. He became that guy. He walked like, I mean, if you would have looked at anything Chris Kyle did, right. He was just, it was perfect. I mean, when you forgot it was Bradley Cooper. Right. And so he trained with SEALs to be authentic. He wore the uniform, right? He was got, he got jacked up. And I'll bet you, if you went and spent time with him and you didn't know who he was, you're like, man, this guy's a Navy SEAL. This guy, look, he knows how to hold the gun. Look, he looks jacked up. He's got the beard. And you're like, this guy's a Navy SEAL. And you know, when you would know when he was not a Navy SEAL, when, when, when the crap hit the fan, right? Then you would know when, when it was time to do some SEAL stuff, you would know that you hired an actor <laughs> and not a, you know, a real Navy SEAL, yeah. you know? So, so, that's why I, I think, you know, you know how I dress. I, I dress the way I want to dress. I don't dress like a baseball coach or even like a business leader or even like a grown adult. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm pretty much like this all the time. You know, uh, I, you know, I do get some new shirts, but here's, here's a quote. <clears throat> There's a vitality of a life force and energy of a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, that expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and will be lost. So I was telling you, you're almost like a song that's going to be sung once. And, or, you know, so instead of dipping your toe in something, you know, do a cannonball, do it your own way and find the things that work for you. I think it's intriguing to look at what these guys do and stuff like that. And sure, I've, I've tried some things and, and stuff like that. But um, at the end of the day, I want this, you know, I want this. There's one going to be one of me coming through. And, um, you know, and, and I want it to make a wave. I want a cannonball. I want to, I want to, so people say, man, that guy, you know. He, he rocked the waves a little bit. Yeah, um, that's a beautiful quote. Send me that so I can put it in yep. the show notes for people yeah, on the blog post. Yep. And and I yep. guess you know that that's just to wrap up wrap up that thought. I mean, for you guys listening, that is definitely not to say don't listen to the advice that that we give on the show and the the things the no, tools that no. we provide. But you know, realize that you're using these to you know optimize yourself. Not you know I have to be you know strictly adhering to so-and-so's routine or this or that it's it's and i think you guys realize well, this, lesson but. from you lesson from you ryan so so let's turn the tables here there's probably no one who's made an impact on my physical health more than you have um and so i remember asking you years ago what was important you know i i want to do better with my nutrition i thought i was doing okay and you you the first question you asked me was like well, what do you do you know like tell me what you're doing like what you know, and you designed a program based around the things that I was doing and wanted to do at that time. You didn't say, um, I want to do this. Oh, do this. This guy does it. You know, you designed a specific program um, unique to me. You know, so I think, I think probably the people that are listening, it's, it's, some, it's a process they already believe in. Mm -hmm. You know, just sometimes we're very good at applying those processes to everything else in our lives. Um, and sometimes we, we, uh, the speeches that we give are the speeches that we need to hear. Um, I'm guilty of that. So, um, yeah. All right, Paul, last question coming up. I'll tell you the question and then I'll buy you a little bit of time. We want to know your top okay. three tips to live optimal. So your time to think starts now, um, for you guys listening, show notes, links, resources, all the cool quotes, uh, everything will be at naturalstacks.com slash Paul Reddick. Uh, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show. Those really do help us. I'm going to read one from Tim Michael. Uh, awesome podcast, five stars. Ryan knows his stuff. I love how he uses his mix of expertise and passion to have real and candid conversations with his guests instead of just reading questions from a script. Tim, thank you for the review. Email me, ryan at naturalstacks.com. We will get you a care package as a thank you. And finally, guys, share the OPP. As you listen to this, people in your life that you know will benefit from and enjoy what we're doing here, share this with them. It is so easy to do on iTunes. Grab that share the episode link, put it on Twitter, email, text, whatever. Uh, that's how we help and reach more people, which as you heard when Paul ran me through 567 is what I want to do. And uh, I hope that bought you enough time, Paul. 
Yeah. So number one is be truthful with yourself. And we, we all know we're not right. So um, I know that the things that hold me back are those events in my life. I'll never get over them. I'm constantly dealing with them. Number two is find somebody to teach you. Um, I think especially if you're a business owner or a leader, we don't get put into positions where we want to uh, feel like we don't have the answer. We're supposed to have the answer. Um, you know, uh, the, the, our boss doesn't have emotional problems. Our boss doesn't have those problems. And I'm going to give, I'm going to give two, but, and maybe two and two and is no, get into therapy. Um, I go to, ther- I have two, two therapy appointments scheduled every month. I don't always go make them both, but I have them scheduled. And if I miss one, I pay the penalty. You know, I, I pay for it. Um, I go whether I feel good or I don't feel good. Most of the times when I go, when I, when I feel good, usually something comes out that's important. We're, we're not going to get through this life um, without uh, breaking that out. So like when we say play football, you're going to play football, you're going to get hit. Um, you're going to get injured. It's inherent in the game. And so um, it's inherent in the game of life. If the only thing you do is just talk out loud about your problems and nothing gets solved, you'll feel like your weight vest was taken off of you. Um, and the last thing I would say is that the worst place to store your thoughts are in your mind. Um, I have three journals. Uh, one journal is I just empty out my mind, whatever's going on in my mind. If I'm dealing with a problem, I'm dealing with this, I got this situation, I'm worried about this, I'm fearful about that, I'm, I'm, I'm prioritizing it, just, just all out of my mind. Um, I have a second journal. It's actually this is my, is my pad that I'm writing the things that come to me during the day and my notes, my projects, stuff like that. And then I have a third journal that I carry around, which is like all the smart stuff that I've ever heard, all the good things. And I review these things daily. So the last, every, what everybody, if there's one thing that I think everybody would agree in optimal performance, it would be clarity. Nobody needs more stuff on their mind. And for me, those tools, and maybe your app, maybe you have apps and stuff you do, but for me, I'm 44, I'm a paper guy. Um, get, get, use those things. Don't, don't get out of your mind. Get, you know, that's, it's the, your, your mind is for um, um, thinking, not for storing. All right. Those are great. Paul, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, for you guys listening, thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks, Monty. 